You finish your proposal and gaze out over a clear blue sky. A steaming towel wipes the stress away. You relax as a flight attendant appears with the chilled Chardonnay you were just thinking about. And as you drift off to sleep, you smile, glad you're flying Lufthansa. Canada, the future in cycling. Since the mountain bike first arrived on the scene, a lot has changed. In the beginning, there was just trail riding. Now we have trials riding, backcountry riding, and the world of cross country, dual slalom, and downhill racing. Technological advances have taken the original clunker with knobby tires and low gears to the complex machines that occupy the gray matter of today's mountain bike psyche aerodynamic carbon fiber wheels, full suspension systems as sophisticated as a racing motorcycle, and intricately machined components that would make a Swiss watchmaker drool. Your basic Rolex on two wheels. Of all the competitive mountain biking events, it's the downhill that is the elemental proving ground for the most tricked out of bikes. The downhill ultimately puts to the test that perfect combination of speed, fear, skill, and technology. It isn't the wizardry of technology that draws people to the sport. It is still simply the skill of the rider and the thrill of the ride. I guess it's like how I get into mountain biking since it's such a crazy story. Because, uh, you know, I think it's good for some other people to know who, who necessarily want to do it, but think that, you know, they can't and they don't have the opportunity to because you just got to create that opportunity. Actually, I was going to college in Hampshire, but I was in Vermont at the time, and I decided that I was just going to, like, take my exams early, bust out, and uh, hitchhike across the country, go to Durango, Colorado. So I hitchhiked out, you know, and I uh, ended up in Durango, Colorado. I rode my bike from Bogota to Durango. Didn't know anybody there. Didn't know a single person there. Like, didn't know anybody. So I just took my tent and just went camping and just camped there. Missy Giovi, the one known as The Missile and reigning world mountain bike downhill champion, is about to head into the 1995 season in defense of her title. I camped it for 10 months, and then um, the winter months were kind of, I didn't camp full, I camped into uh, September, October, November, December. December is when I stopped camping, and it was freezing. It was freezing. Missy is only one of the small number of professional riders, but she represents what the rest of us would love to have, a life dedicated to riding. It's not always an easy ride, but in the case of Missy, it will always be interesting. So what it was like freezing or went on a hot shower or something? Oh, I just like sneak into the dorms, you know, and uh, sleep on the couch or something. You know, I had like, and I also had like, I had like the Kmart's, but 
budget like Star Wars sleeping bag. Okay, we're not talking like North Face Down. Okay, we're talking like the Star Wars. You know, I can't even remember who was on. I think it was, it was like Star Wars was like one side and like E.T. was on the other. All right, it was like on sale. Along with Missy's personal experience of the race scene, the world of mountain biking will be seen in the company of other hot riders who will demonstrate just what a bike can do, where it can take us, and finally, how fast and how far you can go. To think back and just say, you know, I was on the world's podium, I'm like, I started all this in a tent in Durango, Colorado, freezing my ass off my Star Wars ET sleeping bag. The one thing Missy can do faster than talk is ride. The 1995 season started the way 94 ended. Despite nearly crashing on the course in Cap Dye, France, Missy finished the race on a damaged front fork five seconds ahead of the runner-up. After winning another race in Sweden on a very wet and slippery course, she returned to Vail, Colorado, a course she dominated for the past three years and where she earned her world championship title the year before. Final score at Vail, Kim Sonnier finished first for the women ahead of Elka Brutzart and Marla Strepp. And Missy Giovi coming down uh, with that flat tire. Folks, put your hands together. Missy's determination has shown through at races where she finished not just on flat tires, but on bare wheel rims with broken bones and bleeding. Call it determination or just plain crazy. There's something about the mentality of some downhill racers that won't allow them to slow down. Missy, who has broken almost every bone in her body, spends some of her free time doing other high-speed, slam-your-body-into-the-ground type sports, like motocross. The 1993 season could have been her last after a major entanglement with her motorcycle. So I come back from Japan, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to moto. So I saw, as soon as I got up, I'm like, oh my god, dude, this is... I'm not gonna make it. I broke my pelvis in four places. I had compound fractures. I broke like 22 inches of brakes. So my left leg was like disattached from the rest of my body. I thought I broke my back or something, you know? I wasn't sure what it was. It's like weird. It's like, you know, it's like your ass area. You think how you break your ass area. I mean. So how did the season end? Um, how did the season end? Mm -hmm. uh, well, like, as I was like at the World Championships, you know, I'm like going to the finish line and like I flash up in my wheelchair. <laughs> Next thing I'm like, dude, I come down like, I know I won, you know. I had the wheelchair flash, I, I had to have won. The world of mountain biking isn't all about injury and competition. In Vail, just around the corner from the screaming crowds and race action, you can find some of the best single track riding around. Tell me of a place where everybody knew their neighbors. All the families helped each other, and no one ever locked their doors. You tell me no one locked their doors.
my main lead on. This is the kind of ride upon which great pilgrimages are launched. Good single track, tight turns through the trees, laughing, shouting, and marginally out of control in the company of a few friends. Every year in May, many of the best mountain bikers show up in Durango, Colorado for a weekend of racing. Aside from a cross-country race, Durango hosts a road race, a dual slalom, and the Roost Master, a short criterium race full of bumps and jumps where the downhill and cross-country heavies come together to duke it out.
this year, the mud added a bit of excitement to the cross-country race. After the starting gun went off, the riders' only option was to pick up their bikes and run. During the rest of the year, Durango is home for many of the pros, some of whom never stop riding. Well, you know, um, Johnny's a rider. He rides all kinds of things. He rides all kinds of places. Well, you know, sometimes he'll ride up hills, and sometimes he'll ride down hills. You know, sometimes he'll like ride uh, up in the mountains, on the roads, and all over the places in the world. Well, you know, um, it's, it's his job to ride, and he always wants to ride everywhere, and he likes it a lot, too. Mostly, he rides fast, because he's John Tomac.
and happy trails. Lisa Muick, another Durango resident and newly retired from the racing scene, still spends most of her time on the go. For Lisa, retirement only means getting to ride when she wants and where she wants. I guess after nine years of racing, um I got all I needed, and it feels really good to move on now. It's really nice to come down someplace totally brand new, like the Baja. I have a cruiser bike, and um, I don't know, just to have that big old cushy springy seat and the upright handlebars. I really enjoy just kind of bringing it back down to a commuting level, and it's more of a utilitarian thing rather than a career or, you know, recreation. I think I've always been attracted to extreme things. Being the last of six children, I think, uh, I don't know, I guess I had to crack the whip a lot harder. I still have this little part of me that likes to compete. Even if they were, had to race shopping carts, that's what I would do, but. <laughs> it's terribly addicting speed, really. Your mind has to just be, be right there anticipating every split second of the train, what's gonna happen. And when you do that, it's like, Wow, everything's happening just right. Everything from your heart to your hands. Con sangre de noble gladiador surgiera de todos los fuegos con sangre de noble gladiador surgiera de todos los fuegos a la casa de teclas de resaca a la casa de teclas de resaca con sangre de noble Surpiara de todos los fuegos. A la casa de teclas de resaca. A la casa de teclas de resaca. Con sangre de noble gladiador. Surpiara de todos los fuegos. You know, I think it was about the first killing frost in Durango I got a call to come to the Baja. I thought, great, warm days, beach, sun. But the truth is, I've had to work hard for these guys. I've had the worst bicycle wreck of my life, more punctures than I've ever fixed in my whole racing career. I don't get my first coffee until noon. And cripes, not only do I have to carry the heavy cruiser, I'm carrying the tripod, the camera equipment, and the end of the day comes and they say, here, Lisa, have a cold beer. <laughs> nice job. Cripes. 
There are only two types of mountain bikers, those who have crashed and those who are going to crash. Case in point, the third race in the World Cup Downhill Series at Mount Snow, Vermont. Someone is nailing it. Oh. All right. Mount Snow, yeah, that was a fun race this year. <laughs> Made it about 100 yards down. And every year I go there, it's like either I don't make it down because I crash or something happens, like I get a flat tire or something. I'm not exactly sure. I just think I was already too amped and I tried to win, win the race like in this place where I shouldn't have, you know, it was just really rutted out and it kicked my back end up. I was like, uh -huh, and I just didn't, large nose wheel. I should have just crashed, but I like tried to pull it off and I like rode my front wheel like all the way into like the next one and like hit the walls and hit the next one, which is like a wall at the bottom of it and just, you know, tried to, I don't know. I just didn't take my hands off my handlebars. I just didn't want to crash, I guess, you know, I tried to pull it off and at the very last moment I was just like, ugh. My hands were still on my bars, I just hit my head, and I hit my shoulder. I mean, it was kind of going to hit my head really hard, I don't remember exactly how that happened. That's usually the case when you crash really bad, you're like, huh. And everyone's like, oh, aren't you tentative? I'm like, mm, why? <laughs> and then you see yourself on TV, oh, damn, that's nasty. Oh. You all right? I remember like, taking my helmet off and throwing it, I threw it at the cameraman. I knew where I broke my carbone, and I guess it was like all oh, my friends were laughing because they were talking to some guy who was like standing there, he had a walkie talkie, and he's like, oh, I just heard Missy swearing at some of the medics, like, don't touch me, I'm broken. And that, I mean, that's part of racing, I can't not expect it to happen. I deal with it, so now I'm just training really hard and trying to come back, and I'm psyched now because I can bike, I just can't crash, which means I can't still race, not into worlds. That also means that because of her broken collarbone, she wouldn't be racing the Kamikaze in Mammoth, California, the race where she once became the fastest woman on a mountain bike, clocking almost 60 miles per hour in that happens so fast, everything must be in perfect working order for the downhill racer. Your body needs to be strong but flexible. Your mind has to be totally in tune yet relaxed. Your bike has to be decked out with the latest and greatest of componentry and dialed into the particular course. The slightest technical malfunction can hurt your time by the few fractions of a second you need to win. In the downhill, it's just you and your bike. Your only competitor is time. This year, they spent a month clearing the snow off the course, which from a distance looks like just one long dirt road. The actual course is a hard, narrow track that runs down the middle of an otherwise gravelly and bumpy fire road. To jump the track at 50 miles per hour is something best avoided. Most downhill courses cover a variety of terrain. The Kamikaze is a race devoted entirely to speed.
I need to see who, who came in first. It doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. It's going to be a whole package of people. Oh, I know. I just, I wanted to see my person. Okay. They're my friends. What, what, who went by? Do you know? Because you're looking at the camera. Yeah. Who went by first? My old Rockwell. On to Memo to do some commentating for uh, Reebok Eliminator. Um, it was fun. It was cool because we had to talk about my friends and I got to talk about people who don't necessarily get coverage because I know who gets coverage and who doesn't get coverage. So it was fun that way because it's kind of like I had a chance and opportunity to use it to, you know, be able to pump my friends up. And You're right. Are you pumped? Pumped. You're in there already. All right. All right. Girl, take it home, girlfriend. Bring it on. It was fun. My friend Lisa did real well and Giovanna Barazzi won and that was real cool because she's a cool gal. So it was dope. I had a good time, but I would much rather be racing. <laughs> It is a rare breed, those who mountain bike and only mountain bike. Snowboarding and skiing will always have a special place in our hearts, and contrary to popular belief, the two are compatible, at least for Noel Lyons, world-class extreme skier, and Brian Delaney, national champion snowboarder. But can a snowboarder and mountain bike share the same hill? It's possible for Alan and Brian Foster, known to the BMX world as the Foster Brothers.
I want you to be my girl, too. 20! Here's a 20. Seth, 20, 20. I'm about to get a 20 now! He's at the 30! He's at the 20! Here's a I'll pay any car for $20, yeah! A 20. Four. He's still at the 20! 20 inches of food. 20 pounds, 20 days, 20 bucks! 20 ounce. I want you to be 20! Yeah, hey, what's up there, Fruity? Look, we got all the boys rounded up here, ready to go hit it for a fucking kick and ride. Oh, yeah. Bring the 20. Later! Hey, yo. I want everybody to... Get up! I said, get up! Throw the word in the sight of the face. Tell it to all to get on the dance floor. Right now. You know the routine. Ha! My name is in order, but it's not a for My name's Yella. Uh, most people know me as that because I have a company called Yella Designs. I've been riding for about 10 years now, and I figure I got my whole life, and if I have a short life, then I'll get done what I get done in that short life. Well, I think we all we got one thing in common. We've got the ride gene in us. We've got a RI from our mom and a DE from our dad, and that makes ride and uh, ends up working out real well. You know, if, if you don't have that, then I'm sorry, you, you can't really acquire it either. My name is Ray Luscombe. I'm 24. I've been riding for about 13 years now. And uh, I'm a double-A pro. For endurance, I like to climb the fast as a local passes around the Colorado area on my 20-inch BMX bicycle. It really helps hone my strength and, and skills to that specific bike, but it's the descents that really nail it for me. D.O.P. Yeah. So what? Rolling. because I enjoy it and it's a thrill for me to compete against these these other pros that are that are the best in the world. You got Matthew Sylvia, Alan Foster, Tony Zanon Control, Talvin, Raymond Lusco, Mike Hammond, Chris Sudover, and Neil Wood. Bouncing by your back. BMX can be enjoyed by anyone, if you're three all the way up to your 60. Dad can race and the little one can get on a bike and then everybody's fixing everybody else's bicycle. It's a lot of fun and it makes great people. My very favorite class is the five and under boys and girls class because they are, number one, so cute. They are so little, and they are the backbone of the sport. My name is Chris, and I was six intermediate. I like BMX because all the jumps. They fall, they pop up again, they smile, they laugh. It's really my favorite to watch them ride. My favorite pros are the Foster Brothers. The Foster Bros. I'm Brian. 
I'm Alan. I've been racing since 81. 14 years, I guess? Yeah, we compete against each other every weekend. Have you noticed that everybody here in Miami has got an accent? But not me, baby. My name is Libor Karas and I'm 22 years old. I'm from Czechoslovakia. I'm a professional mountain biker. I do ride trials now. Trials is... Uh, basically, stunt riding on the bicycles over obstacles. I won the U.S. National Championships and I won the World Championship in Vail in Colorado. Well, in Miami there is maybe no mountain, but I definitely find something to ride on. Cars are not too bad, sometimes really good for riding on, sometimes really good for riding in. Where are the keys? Where is the keys? Where is or where are? Where is the key? Where are? Where are? Where are? Hey, I hate the English language, it's so hard. First time um, I seen a trials bicycle, I was in a magazine, and uh, I remember that the magazines got uh, had a bunch of pictures with uh, some riders riding over cars and over those rocks. And in the magazine was a little 
um, plan how you can build the um, trials bicycle. So actually, I came up to my dad and can we build it? And he said, yeah, no problem, so we build it. Well, the best thing about trials riding is like, you know, when you got this little cool view, you know, your handlebars and your wheel, and then you just go wherever you want to go. This is Ricardo, proprietor of the establishment, an ace forklift driver, who, after seeing Libor do his thing, said, hey kid, watch this, 180 with a twist. A little Miami-style trials riding. Finally, I found those keys. Well, there's two different things where, um, you know, one is competitions where you have to concentrate on accuracy, at where you're putting your wheels, you know, which way you're riding. And the other thing is finding up new tricks. I like to watch these uh, athletes, you know, who do gymnastic stuff. And when you see something really cool, it's just like, oh, you really need to try with the bike. <laughs> Hasta la vista, baby. I gotta go. In Austria, the law prohibits bikes on the gondola, so a truck brings the riders to the top of the course. That is, all the riders who are competing. I'm here in Capron because I want to race, but I can't because I'm still broken, unfortunately. I just thought maybe that, um, it would be okay if it was going to be feel 100 percent. If it was going to feel 100 percent, and, and, um, and I didn't, and I could crash on it, then I would race, and I would know that until I really got here. And uh, I think I would definitely want to do my debut and be able to crash and be 110 percent at the Worlds and train for that. I got a really good trainer from England, Dave Smith, and working out really hard, my weights, and trying to stretch a lot more, and just riding my road bike a lot, like doing two rides a day, and going to the gym, and checking out the views. Nice vistas here in Europe, <laughs> so, I mean, what can you do? Every summer, the World Cup Downhill Finals are held in Caprune, Austria. The World Cup is a series of races, and the winner is determined by an overall standing. The winner of the final is not necessarily the winner of the World Cup, but the results of this race are a good indication of who the best riders are.
As with most sports, the Euros tend to get more involved in mountain bike racing. Not only are there more spectators, but hundreds of riders show up, decked out in their downhill finery, to try and qualify for the final run. course it's just it's got like a lot to it it goes in and out of a lot of single tracks and like really good technical single tracks high speed fast big ruts like three foot ruts you just kind of threading the needle the whole way down just pushing them it's pretty cool and high speed grass turns just really good combination of everything good rider has to win this race you know I think for me at the world, the main competitors will probably be myself because I need to focus on myself. But I mean, there's always like the good top riders, you know. There's out there, there's Kim from the U.S. Um, there's Mickey Douglas. There's the, the Europeans. There's Shavana Bonazzi, who's like really good one-day racer, and uh, she's got the experience. And then there's new hot ones like the French and Caroline and uh, Nivlin Lacar. So it's gonna be fun. My goal is every time I'm injured to come back and be better than I was before. So that's my goal, and I think that's just going to happen. I mean, I've been waiting to race for three months. It'll be three months by the time Wallace come around, so bet your ass will be ready. You have to be. <laughs> So one day you decide, wouldn't it be cool to go off to some exotic place to do some serious riding and get a major cultural experience on the way? Well, Doug Williams and Perry Quinn from Boulder, Colorado, got some time off work and did just that. It's just incredible because as you're coming in on the plane, you just get this buzz when you look out and see the biggest mountains in the world in the Himalaya. And it, it still, it, it takes your breath away to look at these mountains, realize how big they are, it's pretty much a, a dream for somebody to just be able to leave their job to go and, and mountain bike in the mountains, and especially this far away from home. I mean, it's, it's... To get to Kathmandu, it takes a little time at the airport and a lot of time on the plane, almost three days. Finally, once you clear customs in a haze of jet lag and get your visas, you can see if all your stuff made it in, and then forget sleep. You're there to ride. Every corner, every turn, downtown, you're dodging dysentery, keeping your Hi. mouth shut, jumping body parts. <laughs> Whoa, that was cool. I said, for the record, I'm a vegetarian now.
This sucks. We'll just put these up here. Where's Doug? He should be helping me. He pushed me over. I was uh, actually riding through. Tried to take a step back, and my bag hooked on potatoes, and I fell and tipped all the potatoes over, and they were yelling at me, and half of them were laughing, half of them were like, that's all my money, and I'm <laughs> dumping all my money in the street. I just left. I saw him knock it, and I was like... <laughs> Tried to help him up with the potatoes, and he said, oh, and first he let me help, and then finally said, beat it. Nepal is an amazing place. It, it's, uh, when we first get here, you know, you're just overwhelmed. It's just a sensory overload of smells and sights and sounds. You go to all the different temples and uh, the work that's into those temples and, and the whole, I guess, the cluster of humanity and, and whatnot is, is also real interesting. The children were amazing. I mean, these are some of the happiest kids I've ever seen in my life, you know. And, these two little Tibetan kids are climbing on my bike and they're hanging out and they just fall off and they don't even cry. I mean, they get up and they just start laughing and immediately climb back onto the bike. Being on a bike is, it's a great way to do it. Um, you can see a lot more ground that way and, and you're interacting, you're traveling within their environment. You're not passing through it in a vehicle that kind of cuts you off. Harry and Doug had the good fortune of meeting up with Tenzing, a Tibetan refugee who lives in Kathmandu and works for Himalayan mountain bikes. He helped them find some good rides, took them to all the sites and filled them in on some of the local jargon. What's a gearwala? Uh, it's a, a person who comes to the mon uh, bicycle with a lots of gear on it. Like know? a fancy, yeah. high tech. Yeah, uh, yeah. There should be some gear on it. Then the cog normal head. bike. Yeah. Yeah, at home we call them cog heads or cog tech weenies. <laughs> All right. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Somebody yeah. was calling Doug that downtown in Kathmandu. No, it was you. Uh, no, they called you. you a gearwala. No, they called it you. Wasn't me. Yeah, it was you. Yeah. They just tapped their head at me. They called you the gear wallet. When I was downtown, I was riding along, and I just barely buzzed around this rickshaw. And then I was sitting there, and he came by, and he went like that. And I wasn't sure if he said he liked my head? helmet or if no, he was telling me head? to, you know. No, no, is it on your head? He just put No, he didn't touch me. He touched his own head. He went like that. Yeah, all right. Then he's like, you, you got the nice helmet. Nice helmet? Yeah, OK. Yeah. He That's good, because I thought maybe he was, you know. Give me the bird or something. <laughs> <laughs> you see, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, at Gomja, and now we can go up to Bhaktapur. How old is that city? It's from 16th century. 16th century? Yeah. It used to be a kingdom here yeah, by itself. You know, they, I mean, Nepal is so many kingdoms, but uh -huh. now it's into one.
Ting Ting, we've been riding in the city a lot, and we were just wondering, are there any cool trails real close by? Yeah, you can go up to Nagakot. What is Nagakot? Is that a village? Yeah, it's a village up on the top of the hill. From there, you see all the Himalayas on the front. Uh, any single track riding up there? Yeah, Nagakot is here, but we can do this trail. It's a single trail. Yeah, I'd like to stay on trails instead yeah. of road. This is like up, really what, cool 20, 30,000 feet right in there? <laughs> <laughs> This is a stupa, right? Yeah, it's a Buddhist shine. Okay. We're, we're here. What do we do now? We, uh, you can offer what you can, whatever you can uh, offer. Yeah, afford. We leave a gift. Yeah, is, sure. To Buddha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's for good luck, then. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna need that. You can ask something, what, whatever you want to. So we'll give a gift, and he'll look over us on the trail, maybe. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. need some help. I no think. crash. No crash. So we could ask for that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Safety on it's, the trail. Yeah, it's a Buddhist philosophy. You give something, get something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, what some. we do is we offer a white scarf. Like, I mean, every high pass we can see is stupa. Sure. So we offer. Uh, I think we should give some kind of offering. Absolutely. Well, we got it. It's okay, you think? Yeah, sure. Okay. get your share of adrenaline and scare yourself a lot of times it's great because you come down something and you're just on the edge of control the whole way down and you get down and you just start laughing to yourself and you can't believe that you actually made it down in one piece Other times you're just riding along real mellow and you know you just stop and you take a look around and you, that's what's more important that day. I mean that's what that ride's all about is, is getting where you are and seeing what you're seeing, you know. Not so much what you're doing on your bike, but where you are on your bike. 
While the rest of the world has their different religions and shrines, there are those of us who make a regular practice of toy worship. Just a mountain bike isn't enough for some people. Welcome to HB's Church of Cross training. Prime this baby a little. We have contact. Almost. Cool, you know, you just do something for a while until you get tired of it, then you go do something else. That's the cool thing about cross training, right? Because they don't get bored doing whatever you're doing. <laughs> Probably out of all the things I use for cross training, my favorite would have to be the motos. You know, there's something about these motos that's like a mountain bike or not like a mountain bike. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. But the cool thing is that. You can give your whole body a workout, but you don't have to be sucking wind the whole time. The other cool thing is you get to downhill practice a lot more when you can just roost uphill too. <laughs> newest, sweetest cross-training toy. It's pretty sweet. You know, it's got 16 inches of wheel travel. It's got eight shocks all together. It's got 2200 cc motor, the oversized valves, dual Webers, ported head. It's pretty much uh, rock and roll in this thing. see this here from, you know, because this is kind of top secret in here. I don't know if I should be letting you guys come in here. I guess I'll let you come in here. Oh. Well, it's kind of messy. Right? Yeah, I get some cross-training benefits from, you know, all this stuff, right? Because not only did I have to move it all, but you had to manage it. And plus, so many people like, HB, dude, set me up with one of those tires, would you? HB, got any friends you want to sell? HB, we heard you got a whole stack of this or that. Well. It's really not true. This is all my personal stuff that I use every day. May seem like a lot, but, you know, a guy's gotta do what a guy's gotta do. All right, I'm ready. Remember.
At the World Championships, the seed run determined starting order for the final race. The course was wet and slippery, and though Missy's time was still good enough to put her at a fourth place starting time, she had crashed once on the course, injuring her previously broken collarbone. Uh, what was your time, Missy? You all right in there? Wow, that's great. That's good. What Her shoulder's killing me. Oh, that's not good. so hard. Get Charlie to go work on her right now. Yeah, I'm gonna. Just wanna wait for her. Cameras keep following me. Just one quick question, if you don't mind. You know, you've, you've got a double challenge today. You've got, obviously, the injury that you're contending with and, and less than desirable course conditions. What do you do specifically to adjust, if anything? Uh, no, the course conditions are desirable. I like them. I just like them I can see better. I went to take off the tear off, if you know what that is. They all came off, and I had to take my goggles off, and I ran down the hallway without any uh, eye protection. And that was nearly impossible, so I couldn't really see what I was doing, and I ended up crashing. <laughs> I just got back on quick in a high speed section and just, you know, went as hard as I could. But it's fun. It's a really fun course. I like the mud. I hope it's like this on race day. At the end of each season, an event is held in order to determine who will be the next year's designated world champion in all cycling events, including downhill mountain bike racing. The winner will wear the rainbow jersey, one of the most sought after prizes in the cycling world. This race is unlike others in that it is not a series, but a one-day event. That fact alone can put a tremendous amount of stress on a rider. At the World Championships, you don't have the luxury of several different races, different courses, or different conditions. All you have is one day and one race, and the World Downhill Champion is determined in one run.
Lee Donovan held on to her first place standing, but after Mercedes Gonzalez and Giovanni Benazzi came down, Missy was bumped to fourth, only two seconds from a place on the podium. Contenders, I went for it and I crashed, and that happens. You know? So I had, good, I had a good race. I'm happy. I tried my hardest. I got up slow, but as fast as I could. And I, I went my hardest after that. And it's all I could ask of myself. So I didn't win, but I'm happy. You know? it's, one of those, it's okay. It's okay. The mountain bike experience is individual to everyone. Racing can still be about finishing with a smile on your face, regardless of what place you come in. And riding will always be about having a good time, no matter where, why, or how. Hmm. I think I'm supposed to bring it to boil with it. I think it's good. That's not, that ain't right. That don't look right. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're just, that's a shame. I messed that up pretty, that's gross. Just put my crutches down and hopped on my bike and left from the living room and just busted out. And it was good though, I had a lot of friends who helped me and stuff. And if it wasn't for them and for my mom who came out to help me and my dad's support and stuff, I definitely wouldn't be here because, you know, it's a hard thing to do, come back from by yourself. And I've always been like super independent, so it's been like a really hard thing for me to ask for help. So there's like a lot, a lot of times I get in trouble in my wheelchair. I go to physical therapy every day for like six hours from like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning till like four o'clock in the afternoon and um, three to four o'clock in the afternoon. And so, you know, my ride didn't, my ride wasn't there right on time, you know, or I'd say, oh, I have a ride, you know, or, I, you know, my friend would be like, do you have a ride? So I'm like, yeah, I have a ride. She's like, okay. So I, you know, it's like three, three miles to my house. It's like slightly downhill from the physical therapist. So I would wheel home, right? A couple times I got in trouble, I had this, ugh, dude, I saw this cute chow dog. It was like, oh, fluffy. He's like, <laughs> This purple tunnel, like, dude, I want to pet that dog. It was like across the street. I'm like, okay, I look inside, I look at him. I'm like, you know, come here, chow, chow, come here, chow. Nice chowy chow. And the dog looked like, really friendly. He's looking at me like this. Next thing you know, he's like, <clears throat> bites my freaking ankle, okay? I have pants on and starts dragging me. I'm like, Zzzz. I'm like, dude, let go of me. I can't fall down. I'm like, let go, let go. It's like, Zzzz. brings me down, right? I was in the dog, like, ar, ar, ar. Rips the bottom of my pant leg off, so he's like, uh, he like tumbles on the ground, right? Well, I go like shooting off into this ditch, okay? It was not funny. I don't know how I handled it. But I'm like, ah, I end up in this ditch, so like my head, all I can see is like my head. And like, who saves me but like the post lady, right? Post lady is like driving the man, driving, you know, she's driving the car, but she's driving on the wrong side, right? You know what I'm saying? So she could see me, because I'm in the ditch, so she's driving, she's like, what the hell is that? She stops the dog, I'm like, hey, lady, hey, lady, help me out, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. So I'm like, in this ditch, is awful. So she should go and get some. She couldn't get me out by herself. She had to go because I couldn't walk, you know. I couldn't. So she went in and she had to get some neighbor. And you're still in the wheelchair. I was in the wheelchair. I saved it, man. I was like, I was tiled. <laughs> it wasn't for my downhill expertise. I would have bit the dust. Yeah. So she went and um, got some some guy to help me, and basically he ended up just picking me my wheelchair up and putting me on the road. And the woman like refused to let me, <laughs> refused to let me wheel home. So she put me in her little post office box car and drove me. But it was quite funny. I mean, it was pretty horrifying. Anyway. Mm. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. How you doing? Mm. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Uncle Dave. This cereal's for you. Mm-hmm. <sighs>